Hi everyone, welcome back. In this video, we are going to start our refactoring or restructuring of our DNA toolkit. As you remember, in our last seventh video, we concluded our work on the base set of functions for DNA toolkit. Now we have tested it, all our functionality works as expected, it's time to wrap it in a class. Be more professional, so to speak. Imagine if you have this functionality in the way we have it here, and you want to provide it to someone else to use. And imagine you have 100 functions instead of around 10 functions we have here. They will have to scroll through all of this list and look for different functions and read what they do. This is a very tedious and unprofessional approach. So in this stage, I would assume that you have grasped the basics of Python. If you made it to the video 7, you probably have very good understanding of very basics of Python, like dictionaries, lists, loops, things like that. The next step is object-oriented programming. So instead of giving all of these functions separately in a file, we can create one file that will have a class, and all of this functionality will be attached to that class. We will see why this is very useful. If you're not familiar with object-oriented programming, then you'll be surprised how much more convenient this approach is. Also, you might be familiar with BioPython. So we're going to try to replicate the functionality of BioPython. So create a sequence, and that sequence is going to have a lot of different functionality attached to it. Right now we don't have any sequence, we just create a variable here, and we are using our functionality and we're passing our variable to that functionality, right? So how do we know that these function exists, right? If you never used this DNA toolkit we wrote, how do you know that these functions exist and what they do? Instead, we should be doing something like that. DNA str do a translation, right? Something like that. Or DNA st str, let's say nuke frequency, right? Let's do a short version. So functionality like that should be a part of your variable, not a separate functionality, at least in our case. There are cases where a separate functions are useful, but in our case, we are going to wrap this whole thing into a very nice class and it can be reusable in our upcoming projects. Okay. This approach is also very useful. If you go to, you know, multi-threading, multi-processing, let's say you have multiple experiments you need to perform. You need to find a pattern in a, a large DNA string and you have 10 of them. So we can create 10 instances of DNA string 1, DNA string 2, 3, and we can run them at the same time in parallel on multi-processing or multi-threading, okay? So we are going to take a look at that stuff in our upcoming videos. That's a advanced topic, but it's nonetheless very useful, especially in our case when we need to crunch through a lot of data. All right, so let's run this again just to see what we have written. So our functionality can count the length, it can count nucleotide frequency, do a DNA RNA transcription, generate a reverse complement string, do some GC content calculation in a string and a substring, generate an amino acid sequence from a DNA string, codon frequency calculation, then we can generate reading frames and use these reading frames in our step 10 to find any protein sequence that might be encoded in our string. So the approach we are going to take is we're going to create new files right here in our existing project. And we're going to be taking all of the functionality and kind of moving it into new files. And when it's all moved and tested, we're going to get rid of all of the old files and we're going to be left off with the new class files. So the first file we're going to create is going to be called BioSeq. This is going to be our class, BioSequence class that can be reusable in any other project. So let me go here and create a new file, bioseq.py. Okay. And then the second file is going to be called biostructs, biostructures. Let me create that file too. One point I want to bring up again is at this stage, I would expect you to know how classes work. If you're not sure, I'm going to link Corey Schaefer's amazing videos again. He has a set of videos on classes and they're just unbelievably amazing. You should be able to understand how classes work in full after you watch his videos. So if you're not sure, I will link to these videos right now and in the description below, go watch them and then come back and let's 
wrap our DNA toolkit into a beautiful class. Okay, now we are in our bioseq.py file. Let me open the original functionality as well, side by side, so we can look at the DNA toolkit and basically copy functionality from it. And let me close these two, so we have more screen space. Okay, so here is our original DNA toolkit with all of the functions, and we are gonna be taking these functions and kind of moving them into the class. And of course, we're gonna need to change some of them, not a lot, but somewhat. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to create a class, bioseq class. And of course, we are still using doc strings. So we can point at our class and it's going to say it's a DNA sequence class. Default values are ATCG, DNA, and it has no label. We will see where the label and the type DNA come into play. So the first function we're going to copy will be a validate sequence. So as you remember, we need to validate our sequence before we perform any operations on it. We have to make sure it's a, a valid DNA sequence. As part of refactoring and restructuring, we're going to do optimizations as well. So in our original solution, we use a very naive approach, a very basic approach. We used a simple loop. We looped through a sequence that we have, and we just made sure that all of the letters in that sequence are one of these four letters, A, C, G, T. If it's not, then this sequence is not valid, and we're not interested in working with it. So we are going to take this function, and we are going to optimize it to be Pythonic. Okay, so let's copy this here as it is. Let's do a tabbing because, of course, it has to be a part of a class. Okay, so the first thing we see right away that it says, oh, DNA nucleotides. It cannot find DNA nucleotides. It's because we need this list here. Because we have our new file, Biostructs, we're going to copy it into Biostructs. Again, we are moving our original functionality into our new files. Let's actually move this here so we can see our old stuff and our new stuff. Okay, now we have to, of course, include our Biostructs from Biostructs, import all structures. For now, we just have this DNA, nucleotide structure, right? Okay, so if we save this, it should not complain about that anymore, but it still complains about the sequence. We will see why that is in a second. As we are transferring all our functionality into a class, we're gonna take a look at the first changes we need to do. Because it's a class, it has to have this self variable right here, okay? Again, you have to go through a videos of how classes work to understand this. So our function is working just fine, it seems. So let's make this more Pythonic. Instead of all of this, stuff right here, we can delete that and we can make it a one line of proper Python code, just like that. So we are using a string method is super set. So a string in Python has a lot of methods attached to it. And one of them is is super set. If we are going to switch to our browser now, we're going to take a look at this. So this method, it takes two strings and it just compares return true if all items from Y are present in X. Okay, I'm going to link this in a description as well. So if we're gonna go back to our code again, and we are checking in our case if all of the letters from the sequence that we are validating are part of DNA nucleotide sequence. So if one of the characters here is X, for example, of course it's not part of that, it's not its super set, it is not going to work. So it returns false in this case. If it is a DNA valid DNA string, we are going to return true. So that's great. Now we can see that there is a complaint here because the sequence does not yet exist. And we are going to our init function now. So when we create our class, we have to initialize our class where, with at least default values. Let me copy and paste that initialize function. Okay, so here is our init function. Init function is called every time we instantiate our BioC class as we're going to see when we test it. So when we create an instance of our class here, it will have a default values. Just to make sure if we don't pass anything to it, it still creates something for us to work with. So the default sequence is ATCG, sequence type is DNA, because we are going to add protein and RNA support in the future. And the label is no label. So why label is useful? Imagine you're working with some database file or a FASTA formatted file. As we know, a FASTA file has a first string 
its label or it's a description of the sequence and everything after the first string is actual sequence. So let's say you load this file into BioSeq sequence and it will create a label automatically for you so you know what you are working with. So labels are very useful in this way. We are going to see again in real life example why this is useful. All of the variables in our class have to start with self. Again, that's a specific class stuff, right? You have to learn about. So now we just create our class variables. Our class is going to have sequence, is going to, of course, store our sequence, label, sequence type. So sequence type is going to hold the type of a sequence, of course. This is useful if you want to check what sequence you are working with, right? Sometimes you might want to apply some functionality to an RNA string, but it is a DNA string and you have to make sure you're going to check the type first and then you're going to say, oh, I cannot really apply this RNA spe specific functionality to a DNA string. Do you want to convert it to RNA first, for example? So checks like that. So is valid is our last variable here. It's a Boolean. It is going to hold true or false. And based on that, we are going to abort working with our sequence or we're going to keep working. If it's true, if our sequence is valid, we can keep working on it. We can perform operations on it. If it's false, meaning we try to load some garbage data into it, we're not going to apply any functions on it. And that's the assert here. And of course, we need to do some extra changes because we just moved this function from our original code here. We are not going to be needing this sequence. We just need self because it's part of the class. And we're going to rename this function to match this. As we save, we can see there's no errors anymore. So why don't we need a sequence? Because we are already part of this class and this class has sequence. So the class is going to perform validation on itself instead of we have a separate function validate and we are giving it a class and telling it, can you validate that class for us? We're not outsourcing this work anymore. Class can do its own validation. So that's great. So let's uh, do a first test. We are going to use our main function right here again. That's our old code. How about we just delete all of that stuff right here? We're not going to need that anymore. And our main.py is going to be a nice clean file where we can start testing our new BioSeq. Okay, so we are going to, of course, from bio seek import bioseq. So the bioseq is our class. We imported it from our bioseq.py. And let's create a test DNA equals bioseq. Okay. And of course, because we are using our doc strings, we get this pop-up notification showing what this class has. So it has these three variables, a sequence, a type, and a label. So let's say we don't do anything, we don't pass anything. So it uses these three values as a default values. Let's try running it just to see if it actually works. So we can see that there's nothing printed. Of course, we're not printing anything, but that means our class creation works. It did create a class. So the first thing we can test is validation. So let's say we want to pass ATCG to it as a first parameter, but we're going to leave these two other parameters as default values. We're not going to change them. So we are just passing this and we are overriding this sequence to ATCG, GCT, whatever. And let's run it. Okay, it still works. Let's try introducing X. So what will happen right now, we are overriding this and it's going to become this with a extra X character, which is not part of a DNA nucleotides, and it's going to fail this validate statement here. And it is going to call assert. So assertions are the best way to uh, kind of catch errors in your code. So you can, of course, do if it's invalid, print, oh, you know, this sequence is invalid, but in this case, our code will keep working and executing all of the other functions we're going to implement here, which we don't want. Imagine you load in a broken string, a garbage string, if validation says false, validation prints out, okay, this sequence is false, still tries to perform all of the functionality on it, which is not a good thing. So assertion will stop the execution of a program. It's going to check, okay, it's not valid, I'm going to stop right now, I'm not going to continue. So this script then will stop working, stop executing. We're gonna test that as well. So let's try this. Okay, that's great. Assertion error, 
provided data does not seem to be a correct DNA sequence. That's exact message we have here, okay? So this placeholder here, we're using our sequence type because we specify sequence type here. We are going to be introducing our name protein sequences, of course, so it's going to check if it's a DNA, then it's a wrong DNA string. If it's a wrong RNA, it's going to use RNA string here, okay? So our base functionality works. So the next function we're going to add is something that can help us to debug and basically see the results of our bio sequence. Let's add a function show sequence info. So we can load a sequence into our class and print out what it has. Okay. I'm going to copy this from my snippets again, and it's just one line of code. Okay. Here is our show seek info. This is a helper function we're going to create. It returns four strings, full sequence information. The only thing we do here is we are returning our variables that we set here, our label, our sequence, our biotype, which is a sequence type and the length of our string. So let's go back, delete everything here. So here we create our test DNA and that's an instance of bioseq class, right? So now let's call our show sequence info method. So we have our test DNA that we have created here, an instance of our BioC class, and we have this show sequence info. So if we run this right now, of course, we're not gonna see anything because we are returning strings, we're not printing them. Of course, you could use a print function here to print out this information, but our goal is to have our class do things and return results. It will not handle any printing, any sorting, anything like that. It's just going to take the information, do something with that information and return results. So we are going to have pr to print this stuff that it returns, which is a string. So if we are going to point at this function, it returns four strings, full sequence information. So that helps. We know it returns strings, so we can print those strings. And here is our nice structured output again. It's a no label. So let me make this a bit smaller. We can see that no label because it is a default value sequence is ATCG, DNA, and the length is four. So now we have the information about the sequence we loaded. We can try testing the function a bit more. We can try passing something like that, whatever, just a random string. We can run it again and we can see that's the string that we created our bioseq class instance with. Now we can try let's say creating RNA. In this stage, we're not doing any checks, so this should still work. It is an RNA or whatever. So we're gonna leave it at DNA, and let's say we can create a label. Test label, okay? Okay, so this sequence has a label of test lab, sequence, biotype, and length. Okay, so that's great. We can go back to this assert method now again, just to see why it's better to use asserts than just if is not valid, print something, oh, it's not valid, okay? So we're gonna use asserts instead. So if we are going to pass something like that, it's a invalid sequence. Let's see what is going to happen because we are creating our sequence here with a wrong sequence and we are still trying to print that information from that sequence here even though this part here is already invalid. So this should not even execute. That's great. It stops at this line right here, line 13. It doesn't try to execute, okay? If we do just if statement to check if it's valid and then print out the information, it will still try to execute this and would show us some garbage information or a crash in the application or things like that. So asserts are definitely great. I will link to the assertions information in the description below too. Now let's add another function here, which is going to return just a bioseq type. We are going to be using this functionality in the future as well, when we need to check what type is this sequence. So let's test it right away. So again, we're just returning self type and we can see when we select it, where we set it. We just set it here when we create our instance. So let's print. Again, we are printing because it returns a sequence type. It does not print a sequence type for us. It returns it. And maybe while we're still on it, we should change that to get as well, not show, because we're not showing anything in this function. We are returning 
and this function doesn't show, doesn't print anything, it returns a value and you can handle it yourself. You can print it, you can store it somewhere, you can do some logic on that value. Okay, so here we're gonna change that to get. And the other function we just added was get bioseq type. Before we run this, let's change it to a valid string again and run this code. Okay, so this line here, number eight, just returned the bioseq type. That's great. We have some structure already, so our class is growing. Let's take a quick look at the difference between public and private methods. In our class, all of these methods are public. This might not be a good thing. Let me show you this. So we have the test DNA and it has this functionality, get sequence biotype, get sequence info. Of course, that's great that they are public. We can call them and we can get some information. We can retrieve some information from our class. But why would we need to have validate exposed? So validate should be one of those methods that is only in the class. So class can call validate on itself, it can perform validation on itself. We should not be validating the class outside of that class. So what we can do, we can turn this method into a private method, private to this class by doing this, two underscores before the name of the function. And of course we have to change this here right now too. Let's see what happens now. Of course we need to make sure we save that. Test. Okay, so there is no valid date. There's is valid, which is good. We can return a Boolean value. And there is no method val, okay? So now as a user, we don't have an access to this function. We, we don't need that function exposed because again, the class will perform validation on itself here. So you might be interested in making some of your methods private if they don't need to be exposed. If class uses them inside of itself, then they don't really need to be exposed. Okay, so we are almost done for this video. And one last thing we're going to add is random generation. In our original file, main file, we were generating a random sequence just for tests. I'm going to copy and paste that from my snippets right now. And we are going to add this to be a part of our class. Okay, so this random sequence generation is exactly the same as what we did in our main file before. It's exactly the same sequence here. We are using a random module and we are calling a choice method from that random module and we're telling it here is a list of nucleotides, which is this, and here is a length. Can you go into that list here and pick random values from that list, which are A, C, G, or T, and create a sequence of length 10 in this case? Okay, or we can pass a length we want. The only extra thing we're doing is we reinitializing this class. Okay, we are telling it, okay, we were given a new data here, a random string. Please make sure you reinitialize the class. Because let's say we created right here with this data. And at this stage, for example, we worked, we have finished working with this particular sequence we create here. And we want to reuse this variable here instead of creating a new one, but assign a random sequence to it. Okay, so we can, we have to make sure that we call reinitialize. We cannot just put a new sequence in it without making sure it's a valid sequence. We're going to take a look at this when we test it. We just need to fix this problem here. It says random module is not part of this file. So we have to, of course, import a random module here. Let's save it. And that is going to get rid of that error. So this method is now as well part of our class and it has default values as well as some of our methods here too. So the length will be 10 and the type is going to be DNA. So if we just say generate random sequence, that is what it's going to use and is going to reinitialize it. Let's comment this out for now. And let's run this again, just to make sure that it still runs. That runs. Let's uncomment, for example, this. So again, let's run that. It creates this sequence here. DNA with the sequence and the test lab label. So let's run our newly created method. So test DNA gen generate random sequence. We're going to point at it as we are using doc strings is giving us a good information. Generate a random DNA sequence provided the length. Okay. And we can actually see that the length is default 10 and the sequence type is DNA as a default. 
again, we are going to be adding RNA and protein random generation too. So let's run this. Of course, we need to print. So we create our original sequence right here. We are printing its information here. Then we are saying, can you rewrite what's in this sequence here with something random? Okay, and we're gonna print this again and we we're gonna see how they differ. Okay, so this is our original data from here and we generate a random sequence and here it is and the length 10, of course. Let's run this a couple of more times to see that it generates random sequence in the second case. So that's great. We actually know that it is a randomly generated sequence. That's where the label comes in handy. Okay, so this is it for today. In our next videos, we're gonna continue transferring all our functions and changing them accordingly. You can do that on your own. And if you're stuck, you can just wait for the next video and you can see how this is solved. Let's add one more quick comment here just to make sure we know that these are our DNA toolkit functions. We are going to add some non-DNA toolkit functions, the Dunder methods, but we're gonna talk about them when we're gonna to need to use them. Let's clean up this main file before we go. Okay, so instead of creating uh, that thing by hand, we're gonna create a clean sequence here that uses default values. Then we're gonna ask it to generate random sequence, let's say of the length 40. And let's say, of course, it's DNA. So just as a test, we can pass the DNA thing. And then we print out the information. And here it is, randomly generated string, length 40, it's a DNA, and here's our DNA sequence. Okay, so this is it for today. Thanks a lot for watching and listening. As always, if you have any questions, you can leave them in the comment section below. If you enjoyed that video, make sure to thumbs up and join our Telegram Matrix community to discuss anything bioinformatics and Python related. You can always find me on all of these social platforms listed on this screen right now. Until next time, Rebel Coder signing out.